So hello and welcome to today's CPD session for the T-Level in Education in Childcare. Today we're looking at personal skills and we're going to be exploring theory in relation to education in childcare. The session will be approximately 60 minutes or an hour in, in total and we are recording today's webinar to share it on our YouTube channel at a later date. Thank you. So I, I'm Helen Scanlon, I'm a Provider Development Officer and it's my role at, at NCFE Cash to support centres who are delivering uh, the education and childcare T level. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues now. Hi, so I'm Janet King, I'm the Sector Manager for Education and Childcare. Really delighted to be part of this webinar today where we um, explore some of those theoretical approaches and I'm going to pass over to Stacey Mann. Hi everyone, I'm Stacey Mann, the Early Years and Childcare Subject Specialist at NCFE working on the cash branded products, specifically those in Early Years and Childcare and I'm really looking forward to today's session as well. I'll pass back over to Helen now who is going to launch our first poll. Lovely, thank you. So yes, we're going to start off with a question for you guys um, in relation to learning theories. The question is, which of the following theories do you feel least confident in teaching? I'm going to launch the poll and if you could choose the one from the answer poll, there, the answers there to let us know which, which of those theories do you feel the least confident in? Lovely, thank you to those who voted already. We'll leave that open just a while longer. It'll give everyone the chance. So of the learning theories in the poll there, which are you, do you feel least confident in, please? We're at 50%, so as I say, I'm just gonna leave it all open for a little while longer. Give everyone the opportunity to let us know um, which they feel least confident in and that will help us to inform what what detail and depth we go into for you guys. Just a few more seconds to give everyone the opportunity. Okay, I'm going to close it now. Uh, we've got humanism and, and connectivism. Um, Janet and Stacey are the highest ones for that. Thank you. Okay, let's let's move on to thinking about these theoretical approaches now then. And when we do think about theoretical approaches, we consider perhaps theoretical perspectives. And by that, I refer to the nature nurture that we're familiar with and that we involve our students in. And today we're going to look and we're going to explore this in terms of theoretical approaches and give you some hints and tips along the way in terms of how you could introduce some of these um, through activities with your students. And that's where we feel we could be most productive and most useful. So in this short webinar, we will explore the following theoretical approaches that you can see on there. And please don't worry if some of these terms are unfamiliar to you and you're less familiar um, with the humanism and the connectivism, for example, because the actual theory and when we, uh, when we explore what's involved in that and what and what what that actually means uh, you will be um, certainly more familiar with with that uh, than you think thank you we'll start then by looking at the behaviorist and some of the things that you could do if you were introducing oh if you're introducing these things with your students, you could be thinking about what are the key features, what are the key traits, and that's what we're going to do as this webinar unfolds. So starting with behaviorism then, the key principles there. So behavior shaped by external stimulus rather than internal cognitive processes. So it's about what's going on and how is that impacting um, the way we respond Positive and negative reinforcement can modify behavior, modify our learning, 
So we think about the way we are conditioned, what becomes habitual, how, why do we react in, in the way that we do, what's going on in our external, um, sort of in our lives and our experiences that's having an impact on how we learn. And continuity is central to those long-term associations. So, you know, what are we learning from other people? What's going on in terms of those role models in our lives that might influence, influence us in a positive or negative way? And as we move on to the next slide, we can see actually that a good example of that could be Albert Bandura. And this, again, he'll be somebody that you'll be familiar with in terms of social learning, in terms of observational learning, and, the, uh, the, and how our behaviour and personality is a result of our environment, what we see, what we experience. So, you know, coming back to that, let's have that starting point, looking at those theoretical perspectives, nature, nurture. This is um, aligning us onto that sort of um, nurture um, um, aspect. And some of the things that you could do with your students, and you could think of, of an independent or group study, group activity, you could begin to think about the, the influence of our environment, the role of nurture on our behavior, on our personality. What, you know, do we react in certain ways? because of, of the modeling that's happened in our lives, the influences and the key influences within that, that sort of uh, familial circle. How do we respond in certain situations? Um, what about when we're with our peers, you know, and how we adapt our behavior? Um, and it's, it's very interesting to have those kind of discussions where students may, for the first time, just stop and reflect on that and think about how they're influenced in that way. So, of course, one of the um, one of the well-known um, sort of experiments that's associated with Bandura is that Bobo doll and and how that experiment unfolded in terms of modeling. Um, and, and that might be a good thing to reflect on and discuss and to bring that sort of theory to life um, through a very sort of straightforward type um, of experiment. And, uh, that Banjora used. But the main thing here is, is allowing students to stop and think. This is where the real learning is taking place, really, for them to actually appreciate that we are influenced by, um, you know, by the people around us. And whilst that is a very straightforward concept, of course, then we need to think about, so who's influenced us and how have they influenced us? And is it right? And would we want to change that now that we know that? Was it right? Is it right? Um, and, and, you know, how we adapt in different situations. So, so very interesting conversations can be had around that. As we move on to, to the next slide, we can think about Pavlov and the salvidating, sal I can't even say it, the dogs and the food, salvitation, <laughs> get there in the end. So that's also associated with that conditioning, you know, and that stimulus um, and, and response that the dog learned. So again, there are things that you could do there to explore that. We're building on that, that same sort of approach to that um, external stimuli that we started off by looking at. How uh, are we being conditioned? How are, um, how are habits forming? And what's influencing those? What's going on in our close lives and our um, experiences that have actually um, impacted the way we respond to certain situations? Very rich um, conversations can be had. And Pavlov, a very, again, a very straightforward um, sort of experiment and introduction to the world of conditioning can be can be brought about through that. If we think now of Watson, um, again, we're looking at prediction, habit, repetition. And one thing that you could look at there is the work that he did, an experiment on Little Albert. Now, Little Albert was a, um, it's a difficult experiment to explore, I always think, because ethically it, it leaves a lot to be desired. But the, um, Albert was, was nine months and they repeated the experiment, I think, at 11 months. And um, Albert was introduced to um, a, sort of a white fluffy um, rat as well as other animals. But if we think about the rat in particular um, and 
as a young baby, as a young infant, Albert was was um, fascinated by by this creature, and and watched it, you know, and thought, you know, no no reaction of fear what whatsoever. We as adults, we have our own associations, I think, um, but but little Albert was fascinated. And then what they started to do when they introduced the uh, the rat to Albert, they introduced it with a loud bang, with a with a loud sort of noise, and it startled and upset Albert um, a lot. And and what suddenly became the case, they they then they did that a few times. Albert had the same reaction because he was startled and he was frightened, and then he associated the fear of the noise with with the rat, obviously. And when the when the rat appeared without the noise. The crying and the and and the fear and the panic was was still present from from Albert. So, uh, ethically, um, you know, you have your doubts about these sorts of things uh, and these sorts of experiments. But it's a good way of showing um, and explaining how those habits um, are formed. So, um, little Albert's a, a very simple, straightforward way of of showing that. We then um, move on to think about Thorndike. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I've explained that. I got carried away because I like Little Albert because he's a very straightforward way of introducing that. But again, you could use that as part of that group discussion um, and thinking about, uh, you know, how habits are formed and the associations. It's quite fascinating the things that we associate with, you know, um, maybe the fears that we have. What are we associating that with? What are we really frightened of? And and it could well be that that we've experienced something similar to, to Albert in terms of we're frightened of that, but we're not really frightened of that. We, we, we've been frightened by something else that we now associate with it. Interesting conversations to have. Absolutely, Janet. Um, and it's Helen here again. Sorry, I've popped the uh, the link to the Simply Psychology website into the chat to, that relates to the little Albert work. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. So that will give, yeah, that, that, that's a really nice one. So it just gives you that sort of straightforward overview of what that, um, what that experiment was from Watson. And, um, and on the next slide, we, we're looking um, at Thorndike, again, associated with conditioning um, and in particular, the idea of, of reward and operant conditioning. So, you know, we, it's the term given, as it says, to the behavior that precedes a reward. So a treat that's awarded for a desired behavior. And, you know, in your small groups with students, you can think about the different types um, of conditioning and the different kinds of, of, of operant and classical conditioning, discussing all of that, but also then leading out to those discussions around the idea of of, um, of reward and, and and why we do things and and how we can actually do we form good habits from that bad habits from that what sorts of things can you relate to that are going on in in the world that actually you know we we, we might reward um in this way you know the, the the dog that won't be quiet i can relate to this a very noisy dog i had this morning on a conversation with helen and um, that continued for many conversations and I, re I rewarded, I, I rewarded the dog um, because I wanted the dog to be quiet and I knew there would be a response from that. Totally, totally wrong thing to do, but it's an example and, and we do do those sorts of things. So that, that, you know, having those rich discussions around that can really help bring, bring home the idea of, um, of how we use operant um, conditioning. Another example there, we, if we look at Skinner again, um, very, uh, very familiar. Um, you, you probably have all heard of, of Skinner um, and, it, you know, all of these theories did a lot more work than the things that we are sort of spotlighting today. But we're doing this in context and we're thinking about the, the level and the the, the relevance of the theory in relation to the syllabus. So Skinner, for example, um, one aspect of, of his work was around that reinforcement and about positive and negative reinforcement and the influence that can have on the way we respond. And by behavior, you know, we're looking, we're thinking about the actions, the way that we may, we may control our behavior, adapt our behavior, refrain and restrain ourselves from certain behavior in certain situations, because we start to adapt to what people expect. So again, you could have conversations around that. And um, behavior that is positively reinforced according to, to Skinner uh, through a positive gesture, through praise, 
then you're going to feel good about that. We all like to feel that we've met an expectation as, as social creatures, as human beings. And so we, there's a tendency to want to repeat that. And then behavior that is negatively reinforced is more likely to, to, to stop if that um, behavior is, is met with a sanction, a punishment, you know, a removal of something that that um, that, that child um, or um, and so on really, really wants and examples of that. So in your groups with with the students, you can think of positive and negative reinforcement and you can relate that, you know, to 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 your examples and maybe give scenarios and case studies of, of where this has happened and how we influence each other through this sort of thing. You know, do how do we use our body language to to do this, for example, because I I I, I can think of teachers, I only they only need to look at me and I knew. Okay, that I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that, or I need to be quiet now, you know. And I can also think of teachers who would nod and who would smile and who would give me that sort of that that positive regard, that positive reinforcement. So that you know, thinking of examples like that would would really enrich the experiences for your students there. I think. Okay, now I believe I'm going to hand over to Helen, and we're going to have a bit of a quiz. Okay, thanks, Janet. So far, um, there's a there's a link on the screen there, which I'm going to pop into the chat box. But there's also the um, the QR code if you have a, a phone that can um, can scan that with your camera. If you haven't used a QR code, this is a, a Microsoft form where you can ask people to complete it. Um, we've set it up as a multiple choice question. Um, here so that it would be easier for you to, to do on a phone or on a tablet if you're using that. So I'm just going to pause for a second uh, and pop the um, pop that web address into the chat so that you can you can use it. So just give me a second. Thanks, Helen. And I think all of the things we've talked about so far, yes, some of these, some of the uh, theories. In fact, most of those theories, you, your theorists, any, at any rate, you'll you'll have been familiar with, and you know we've explored how how they fit into that sort of behaviourist approach, the way that our behaviour is adapted, the way that habits are formed, the way that external stimuli affects the way we respond um, and it's it, it does us all good sometimes just to stop and reflect on that but um, what we wanted to do through this webinar is give you hints and tips for what can be a very difficult subject area to uh, engage students with especially when they're learning this um, for you know a, 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 for the first time it's it can be a difficult concept the word theory the word theoretical you know they're difficult in in, in the uh, in their own right to be honest so if we start with that sort of nature nurture and then we explore that through different approaches we, we can start to become familiar with what those um, approaches are and the sort of the family if you like that they that they live within um, for example within the behaviorism um, and the behaviorist approach so thinking about okay behaviorist impacts on on the way we feel on the way we behave on the way on the way habits are formed which which sort of uh theoretic what are the main buzzwords there well we talked about reinforcement we talked about operant conditioning we talked about classical conditioning um, and then which theories do we associate with that so you're building up that confidence and maybe spending some time just thinking about that these students are not psychology students but just giving them that sort of understanding um, in, in terms of what, what, these, um, what these different approaches and perspectives for theory actually mean. Okay, thanks for that, Janet. So as I say, either use your phone um, or a camera to scan that QR code. It should take you straight to the Microsoft form or I've, put, see, I've popped the link that's on the screen now into the chat box, you can click on the link. Uh, and I know that people have been able to do this so far because I can see responses coming in. So I'm going to give just a, a minute or so to allow everybody to have a go. And then I'm going to share the, the results um, via the, the Microsoft Forms website. Um, and also you can have a think about how you could use that yourselves with, with your students. Um, Microsoft Forms 
is a very simple and straightforward way of creating a quiz and making something interactive and just stopping for a moment and and doing a bit of a sense check or doing a bit of a an assessment of of where where you're at where the students are at are they with you what do you need to work more on possibly and um, if you haven't used microsoft forms and um, please talk to us about how you would how you would do so if you need any advice and guidance. I'm a bit of a technophobe and if I can do it, I believe anyone can do it. So um, we're, we are here to support and guide you though if, if you need it. I think I'll be taking you up on that as well, Helen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I mean, as, as we are becoming more technically reliant, or, you know, we have been very technically, rel technically reliant for the past few months, haven't we, in, in the situation we find ourselves in. So um, I am going to just share my screen. Just I'll just change what you're looking at to, to be looking at this. So this is the, the, um, the question. As you can see, there are three responses. Um, and basically it asks for your name so that's just a free text box and then you set up the question and obviously my view as the facilitator shows that I've set which is the correct answer so when it's multiple choice obviously you need to set uh, the answer so Maslow and then talks about there's a question about Bruna and then the zone of proximal, proximal development with, by, by, with him I got ski. Little Albert is there, if we've already talked about. So as you can see, we've done assessment on something we've talked about and some things we haven't talked about. So, you know, we are assessing what's gone in and assessing um, existing knowledge as well. And then we've got another question about Skinner. Um, and then the one using technology, but then this is for you guys uh, in relation to us. Um, we've, we've split um, teaching and assessing learner theory up into a few different questions then that's set up as a as a Likert scale type of question and, and I can go to the responses and see what what everybody has said so that was me obviously thank you Susanna and Lisa it'll not tell us exactly who said what as we go down so please don't worry um, you, you won't know who said what oh we've got another response as we it's with it. Oh, thanks for your one of star. So hopefully you can see that it then gives us um, a visual representation. So the actual data and then a, a pie chart. So showing who who said what. Um, everybody got the, the Bruner question right and everybody got the Vygotsky question right, as well as Little Albert, which we've talked about. Um, we've the, the Skinner question and the um, connectivism and then of course this this is the overview of the Likert scale so at a glance we can see that people are gen across the board if you like for teaching it we've got another answer in there a oh, lifetime the answers are coming in it's wonderful assessing student knowledge creating assessment tasks as, as a formative activity and then supporting the students to apply the theory to practice. I was asked earlier in the question box about an assessor being here, will it be relevant? This is where assessors and people going into the industry placement are going to be vital to help reinforce what the students are learning in the core and in the occupational specialism and applying that theory to the practice. So, so yes, absolutely, that you don't necessarily have to teach it, but you, you'll do a re, the, the big favour helping them to apply it in, in their industry placement. So that's just an example of a Microsoft form um, and it's a, a, just a little break from, from the talk and if you like. Um, so yes, please talk to us if you'd like any support or guidance on how to do those. A nice way to embed a little bit of maths as well, Helen I. <laughs> oh yes, always, always. Okay, so as Janet said, theories can be quite heavy and so it's great to get students to tune in to some of these theories and make those connections and those associations, which is Bandura, everybody knows about the Bobo doll and it's it's making those connections that help them to cement the knowledge and remember that information. So we're moving on now to the cognitivist um, approach and the key principles from this are the act of or process of knowing is driven by mental processes rather than the environment. The individuals process the new information by making links with prior knowledge. Learning is measured by a change in an individual schema. 
which is probably a very familiar word, and instructions should be logical and well structured. So I think we've got that one twice, haven't we? So one of the first theorists we're going to look at today is Carol Dweck. She's associated with attitudes to learning, how we're motivated by learning, um, and the associated terms include entity and incremental. So there are two main mindsets that we can navigate life through, and that's uh, with a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Having a growth mindset is essential for success how to develop the right mindset for improving your intelligence. And entity within that refers to an individual's belief that abilities around cognition and intelligence are fixed. So typically you might hear somebody say, I can't do maths, and that would be a fixed mindset. And then incremental will be about the cognition and intellect being more malleable. So if I try hard and practice, my maths will improve. And that's the, the growth mindset. Where we see this a lot at the moment is in primary schools. There's lots of posters around uh, about uh, growth mindset. My own children come from school and tell me about growth mindset. And if I say I can't do something, they quickly pick me up on it and say, you can't do it yet. And they use the power of yet. Um, and I think that students can really get tuned in to this particular theory. Um, and by doing that, they can, we can do that through, should I say, um, discussing how they feel about learning, what their own motivators are and their barriers to learning. Often it's from past experiences and how, how they, their parents may have felt about particular learning. Um, you could research Dweck and her work on motivation and discuss that as a group. Look for those definitions as we've discussed on entity and incremental and discuss that as a, a peer group. And also reflect on own attitude to learning and motivation, either as your own CPD or for the students to reflect on their own attitude to learning and motivation as well. I often find having positive quotes and things like that will support the students. And so they will pick up on that and they'll see that that's working within a growth mindset and make that link to this theory, theoretical approach. Next, we're looking at um, Robert Gagné, which I always find really, really difficult to pronounce and probably not as well known as the others. There's certainly not as much information online about him. Um, but he was an educational psych psychologist who pioneered the science of instruction in the 1940s. And his book, The Conditions of Learning, was first published in 1965. He identified the mental conditions that are necessary for effective learning. And he looked at the five categories of learning. So to support the students with this one, it would be really to look at the five categories of learning, research those, which are verbal information, intellectual skills, cognitive strategies, motor skills and attitudes. And he suggests that learning tasks can be organised in a hierarchy, so from stimulus recognition to problem solving, and the students could research all of that and then discuss that back with their, their peer group. And it will be an excellent way to get to know what he did and also to think about how that applies to early years, because I think some of the other ones are much easier to see how they apply to early years, as we'll see as we go through. Next, we have Piaget, um, and I laugh because it's probably the most well-known one. Um, and the one that everybody talks to me about as soon as I say theory. Um, so we, we do know quite a lot about Piaget. We've got quite a lot still within our uh, frameworks using Piaget's work. So this is all about how we learn. The way that Piaget approached this theory was through stages of development. Um, and he looked at schemas, under, uh, that the understanding, the knowledge base that you already have, and then assimilation, taking in and understanding that new information and accommodation, extending our understanding, building and modifying and, and adapting our knowledge base. According to Piaget, children are born with a very basic mental structure, genetically inherited and evolved. 
on which all subsequent learning and knowledge knowledge are based and he thinks that schemas or he thought that schemas were the basic building blocks of cognitive models and it enables us to form a mental representation of the world and Piaget's work on schemas has continued with Chris Athey and Cathy Nut Brown so there's quite a lot to to pick apart there quite a lot to look at for the students and some of the ways that we can do that are Research in the stages identified by Piaget, um, which are listed there, but also looking at how that links in with the early years, um, the early years framework that we're using, what the students observe when they are in practice. So we're now moving smoothly onto the constructivist approach. And the key principles here are Individuals create their own understanding by linking new information to previous experiences and cultural factors. Their knowledge is constructed through interactions between the teacher and the student, in which the teacher scaffolds learning to encourage greater independence. And there's a, there's a big um, hint there about who we're going to talk about. Instruction is organised around problem solving, projects and cooperative learning. So firstly, we have Bruna here and Bruna suggests that all learning at all levels is best achieved by moving through these three stages. So inactive is action based learning by doing and what you might um, make links to here with the characteristics of effective learning, um, teaching and learning within the early years framework. Iconic, which is image based sensory stimulation. Symbolic is all about the language being used. To explain this as a constructivist, we need to think about how individuals link new information to previous experiences and taking into account the particular cultural factors. So that could be research in the work of Brunner and scaffolding, using examples to describe how adults in education and childcare scaffold learning for children and young people which we'll have a look at with some of the other theorists that we move on to next. So we have John Dewey, who, Dewey, um, that he believed that children learn whilst doing and agreed with Vygotsky that it was often from the more knowledgeable other that you learnt that information from. He was an advocate for the emergent curriculum or what we call nowadays planning for interests. He thought that you could um, actively engage and interact with the environment actively in their learning and problem solving and inquiry based learning. And again, we can research the terms highlight highlighted in that statement and use examples from teaching and learning and really use your own examples to support and cement the knowledge of um, Dewey. Vygotsky is another one that we're probably quite familiar with, although he didn't come up with the term scaffolding, it's something that evolved. He did talk about the zone of proximal development so the zones of proximal development, I think, are it's really important to get the students tuned in here so we can talk to them about things and activities that they might do where they need that role of the significant other, the more knowledgeable other to support them in learning something new. So, for example, driving, they might be able to drive forwards and backwards, but not parallel park. And so to parallel park, they may need their driving instructor with them. And so it's all about that supporting and scaffolding to problem solve and support that knowledge acquisition. It's the difference between what a learner can do without help and what they can do with help. So this is quite a nice one to explore, I think, with students because it, they, they can have there's lots of different um, videos that you can watch. There's lots of different diagrams that you can pick apart and there's lots of different examples that you can use and they will probably come up with their examples as well. So you can research the zones of proximal and actual development and reflect on how you learn skills 
and even try and try to learn a new skill such as origami or a new card game um, and think about how important the scaffolding process is and also their reflection on how they are supporting the children when they are in replacement. So this is a potential video that you could use in training here, or I think we might try and see if we can watch it. What shall we, Helen? I can do. Just give me a second to arrange that now. I'll, I'll be back in one second. While while Helen's doing that, that what you were saying there, Stacey, about yeah. Vygotsky just made me think about some of the fun we had in, in the classroom as an activity, bringing on board that sort of zone of proximal and zone of actual. And the students were asked to think of a skill that they had that they could share with um, with one of their peers. And we had a lot of fun in, in terms of, you know, um, simple things like you know the cat's cradle or a card game or something and just thinking okay and um, what kind of new rules are you teaching through this skill and 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 we had a lot of fun doing that so that's something that that you could think about and that you could do just to try and consolidate the um you know the the, the theory there around the proximal and the actual so i've got the video ready to play i've turned the sound off so that stacy can can talk us through it OK, so we've got Lev Vygotsky here, as, as you can see, because it's an animation, it's quite nice to, to use in the classroom. Um, so it tells you a little bit about who he was and what he did and his contribution of the zone of proximal development. And when you do watch this particular video, it's just music um, that's with it. So it's quite visual um, and will be lovely for your visual, visual learners. Um, and it will show you different parts of the zone of proximal development and uh, from start to finish. So I'll let you have a read of that instead of listening to me. I think what's useful here is that it's so different and as you say, Stacey, very visual. So if you wanted to break something up, just like we're doing today, um, you can break it up with this kind of video. Um, and, and students are used to going on YouTube and, and accessing this kind of um, information. They're used to the, the way it's delivered. So uh, yeah, nice to, to use to break things up. Absolutely. And they can revisit revisit this because it's on YouTube. And if they don't always get it the first time, you can just go back and remind yourself of it. It's quite a short one as well, so it's not too um too onerous on the on the day. From a teaching and learn perspective, I always give the students a reason for watching it rather than just saying watch that video. Give give them a reason and you can even differentiate that reason. You can ask some students to, to explain it after they've watched it, some, some students to justify something about it, something they liked or disliked, etc. So you can you can scaffold and differentiate tasks for them to actually watch it rather than just saying watch the video. And by the looks of that last little message there about <laughs> that, that, that um, teachers should be looking at where the zone of proximal development is and where the zone of actual development is, they'll probably come back and that might bite you. <laughs> they might be telling you where their, theirs is. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. So I've come back to that. And as I say, that's on the, the handout for you. It makes you think, doesn't it, as well, when you look at that, it just reminds you of that student centeredness, that child centeredness that we can we can actually apply to um, to education and childcare across the across the scale, really. OK, so thank you, Stacey. We're going to move on now and think about um, a humanist approach. And I know that when we started the, the webinar, that was one of the areas that, that was ticked as not being one that was very familiar to you, but I actually think it's one that you will understand the most. So um, learning, as it says on here, is a holistic experience. 
with in which individuals construct knowledge in the context of their own feelings, values and experiences. And that is so true, isn't it? Everything that happens to us, we, we're sort of, the impact is how we feel. How does that make us feel? Therefore, how can we apply ourselves to that? And we've all got these unique feelings because we've all had unique experiences and those experiences are, are, are further impacted by, um, you know, by culture, by um, by family, by things that influence that culture and, and, and family models and so on. So we've all got that, that uh, we're all touched by the humanist approach because we bring we bring so many feelings and, we, we, and complications into how we learn. So feelings are as important as knowledge in the learning process. And we all know that and appreciate that, don't we? Some days, there's no way we, we could probably take on new learning and new knowledge. And other days, we really definitely can. So, and we feel upbeat and we feel as though, yep, I'm ready for this, good to learn. And also we could go uh, as students, we were going into a new program, into a new course, and we just think, none of this is making any sense. Why have I done this? What have I done? And so that is all part of that process. And then we begin to something will make us feel we can contribute, we can participate. What is that something? And there's discussions that you can have around that. And of course, as tutors, as teachers, we're facilitating that personalized student-led approach to education. And a good example, when we move on to think about Bron from Brenner, um, he, this, is, this is a good example. And again, when you first look at that, you think, oh, blimey, you know, ecological systems theory, environmental, societal influences. Why do people have to use all of these sort of complicated terms to actually, when, when they're actually saying everything that happens within our circle of, um, of experience? has an impact and does matter. And I think it's, it's, being, um, it's being able to introduce these terms in such a way that the students can relate to them. And humanism is all about that. So we think about Brom from Brenner and we can actually think, okay, what's our microsystem? So bring it, make it personal. What, you know, what, what would be our microsystem? Oh, okay, it's, it's my immediate environment. And that's, that, that includes my family, my carers my friends. What about that MISO system? The strength of the relationships. So you're a little bit wider. What about the people that are, that, that are impacting my life? My, my tutors, my teachers, the choices, what's going on? In, um, what, what about my friends and my peers? So we're going wider than what's in our immediate environment. You might find that the, that the students in their immediate environment, what's more important to them than family is, is actually their peers, their boyfriends, their girlfriends, that, that, you know, all of this sort of thing. And that, that's significant and should be part, let them explore all of that, let them discuss all of that. And then we're thinking about, you know, bring it back to young children, what's in their microsystem? What's in their um, MISO system? What's in their, exosystem? What about the factors that are coming externally that are impacting family dynamics? And how is that influencing the way that we learn? If somebody within our family is having a bad day or something's going wrong, that impacts us. If we're going to work, you know, with, with all of that sort of problems, we're carrying all of that around with us. We know it affects us as adults. Do we stop and think how, you know, we can leave, we, we leave all of that at the door. Do we think about how, how young children are feeling? So talking about that and bringing that into conversation and discussion. And then of course, the macro system. So the cultural influences, the things that are tying all of those family ties together, if you like, how is that impacting? What about the aspirations that, that might go with that for, for children and young people? So you introducing all of these new terms, finding out more of this uh, about this ecological systems theory, looking at images. So maybe presenting this in a circular form, thinking about it in relation to yourself as, as a student, and then thinking about that once you're familiar with what those terms mean in relation to 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 children and young people. 
So that's a, a really good way uh, of, of introducing uh, from Brenner. If we, everybody will, will have heard of Maslow and Maslow, of course, with, with the hierarchy of needs. And we're looking now at that intrinsic motivation where we're not necessarily seeking an external reward. Remember when we looked at operant conditioning, we don't need that external reward perhaps, but what we do need is something that motivates us. And that could well be something like, um, it could be a promotion. It, I suppose you could think about that as a reward. It could be a nod or a smile, um, you know, so you're actually thinking about what makes that young child want to learn more? What makes that young child happy? And that could just be a smile. It could be a, it could be a bit of time. It could be making sure you're meeting all of those needs. So thinking about Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, which I know you're familiar with, and, and, and sort of thinking about that from, from a young person's point of view, I think this is all about, you know, I know you know about this. How do you ensure that students are able to build up enough knowledge in the amount of time that, that you have to be able to um, apply the, that basic understanding? So thinking about that again from your own, what, what's your, what, you know, what are physiological needs? What do we mean, um, you know, but, but when we go through these different stages in Maslow's hierarchy and then thinking about that by looking at a child's day, a young child's day, a young person's day in school, how are these needs being met? And that, that will help, um, that will help the, the, the just the importance of that intrinsic motivation and the hierarchy of needs to be understood by the students. Okay, so Knowles and Rogers, so Malcolm Knowles and, and, and Carl Rogers, sort of key players in, in humanism. Um, and that natural, this Malcolm, Malcolm Knowles talked about a natural desire to learn. And the fact that, you know, we, we have this natural desire to learn and by learn, we, we mean inquisitiveness you know, curiosity, all of those things that, that, that we love. Um, and that, that learning should be facilitated through that person-centered appreciation and provision of opportunity. So everything that you are doing with your students, when you think about the way that you respond to the teaching and learning environment, when you change what you do because, you know, somebody's got uh, their makeup out or, um, Bill has just walked out or he's, you know, he's put his headphones on or whatever. You change the way that you do things responsively and instinctively. And this is about how do we do that um, to ensure that young children are tuned in, that, that we keep that light alive for, for their learning as well. So everything, again, relating to them um, so that they understand it and then bringing it into to education and childcare in context with examples. And Carl Rogers here, talking about a healthy environment for learning and growth. We know that an acceptance, unconditional positive regard, valued and encouraged to participate, to contribute, to have empathy and to show empathy, to model all of these wonderful qualities and characteristics that are allowing that intrinsic desire to learn, to, to actually um, to develop and grow. And as I said at the beginning, some, some people were on the webinar today chose web, uh, humanism as something that they were less familiar with, but actually it's something that you will understand the most. And I would stand by that statement. So again, there's some ideas there for independent and group study that you could do with the students. But the biggest thing I, for this really, again, it's reflecting, it's about making sense of this theory uh, and all the theories that we've talked about so far by trying to put them in a, in a way that's relative to the student and where they are now and then contextualize them and allow the students to explore that contextualization through their own experiences and activities as well. Um, I do believe we're going to move on now um, to, uh, to look at connectivism. Okay, so connectivism is another one where people um, didn't tick it um, or, or did, you know, thought this was less familiar. 
and actually I'd be I'd be putting my hand up with you um, if we, if I was looking at this a few months ago before we were looking at the at the T levels I thought what's this you know what 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 I've heard of the other approaches I'll need to do a little bit of digging because it's been a while but I've not heard of this what's this so connectivism really is those realms of technology that we're that we're actually using so we're using connectivism and we've been using connectivism for a long time now. So the key principles of it is how we're applying that in our learning, creating new ways for people to share knowledge and to learn from others. And there's been no greater example than the way that teachers and the way that you've had to adapt and, and how you continue to use that blended learning approach. And of course, the expectations from students that are, that are coming to you they have an expectation that there'll be some technology. Ofsted have an expectation that there's going to be some technology in the learning programs. And this is about connectivism. So it's about facilitating that um, and making sure that you're looking at, at networks and massively open online courses is something um, that key people in, in this were looking at. So people like Downs and Siemens were very um, influential in, in this field, learning through technology and how it's accessed and utilized. Okay, so there's some ideas there reflecting on the different ways technology is used as part of education and childcare. What's going on in your own lives? Again, are we starting with the students? What's going on in education? How have you been using technology? You know, and, and for students to stop and think, when was the last time you used technology? Oh, two minutes ago, sorry, I was just on my phone. You know, the, those things that are happening all of the time that now is incidental. We do, we use technology without thinking and we rely on it as part of our learning without thinking. Some students um, will be, will be, will resist books um, because they want to, uh, they want to search on, on the internet. So it's about that sort of wider use of technology and how that comes together. I'm going to stop there and hand back over to Stacey. Oh, we're having a Jamboard activity. Helen. Yes, it's over to me now. So that was a that was a, a really good segue into our Jamboard activity. I'm not sure if you've used Jamboard before. This is an adaptation of one of my um, favourite type of teaching and learning and assessment activities, a good old card sorting activity, um, where Jamboard, I'm going to pop the link to the Jamboard into the chat in a second, where you can give everyone, as I say, the link to um, an online portal where you can use sticky notes, you can do sorting exercises, etc. But basically, we've created a, an online using technology way of doing a card sorting activity. So I'm going to pop the uh, link up on there, but then I'm going to pop it into the chat. So while I do that, I'm going to ask uh, Janet to talk about this card activity for me, please. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a brilliant, brilliant way of using connectivism um, to allow the, the, the students to actually find, um, you know, some, it's really a matching type where you could actually say, okay, we've got a statement, we've got a description there about a particular theoretical approach. How are we going to connect these? Who are the main theories approach to these? So it's almost a bit sort of drag and drop. Yeah. But what it actually does is allow people to interact. A Jamboard is a really good way of being able to interact with it. So we're using connectivism and you could, you could use that as your example. And it's a good way to be able to consolidate, I think, Helen, some of the learning theories that we've talked about today. Absolutely. So I can see people have clicked on the link and are using it. And so, yes, as you can see, what's happening now is the um, learning theory name, a description for each of them and the main theorists for them um, are on that board. And as you can see, people are already starting to move them around. It's a case of matching up the, the learning theory name with a description and their main theorists. Um, and as I say, this could be done like this using technology, or you could have this printed on cards and them having, you know, them, the students doing it in the classroom in a group. But um, if you've got technology that allows this, you can have them talking to each other and discussing what they're moving around um, just like this. Jamboard, very easy to, to make and use again. If you want any help or advice and guidance, you just give me a shout. Uh, 
back to if I can do it, anybody can. Um, and there's lots of different things you can do with Jamboard. This is just one example of, of how your students can interact uh, on, in, in the subject here of learning theories. Um, uh, you can assess how they're doing. Everybody can look at it on their own computer. Uh, I'm sharing my screen because I'm the owner of this and I can I can show what's happening in, in live time. But uh, yes, it's just another way that you can engage students. You can have them do this at the start of a session to do some initial assessment on, on their existing skills and knowledge. And then you can do it again at the end um, to, to be a plenary or a summary or, or even have it done on card at first and then technology later or vice versa. Um, and then it's also an ipsative assessment. You can you can check how progress has been made during the session. Um, I'm just going to swap over to the next page of this because the answers are on the next page. Um, we've put this together so that you've got the answers there as well. But uh, back to the first page where people are just moving them around quite nicely. And this is exactly how it would work in practice. Excellent. I think the flexibility of it and the fact that, you know, you could have some real fun with, with uh, connectivism in this way and use in this sort of approach, couldn't you, Helen? And, and really, a, you know, have um, these kind of activities going on. And, and also, if you were using um, a matching activity, there, there's so many different ways of being able to use it. And students would really enjoy creating some things, I think, in this way for them to to, to test their own knowledge or to test their peers as well. You could have some really good fun and, and a bit of a quiz, couldn't you, like that? Absolutely, yes. Total agreement. Um, so these are, I was going to say, Stacey, do you want to talk through these ones? Yeah, I can do. So um, just thinking about how we can um, support learning theories and um, all of these theoretical approaches that we've looked at so far, we could, um, have a look at getting the students to do peer presentations. Um, I love doing peer presentations. Um, I know some some students really struggle with them, um, but it does support. You know, they can take different roles in that in that student student presentation. They can do it in, in small groups or they can do it individually. I still remember the one I did 22 years ago, um, and still remember some of the things that I said. Um, our question was, who is the giant whose shoulders we stand on? So we use the understanding gained by major thinkers who have gone before us and then come up with our own presentation at the end um, and our own theory at the end, which I named the wall theory. So I was a, a wall, then not a man. So you could do that with your um, students and use that knowledge to work independently or in small groups and just go through those um, those points there of outlining each approach, identifying examples, considering criticisms to the theory, and also looking at how that now um, works in practice in the early years foundation stages and in education. Lovely, thanks, Stacey. And I like okay. the um, the alternative approaches at the bottom there are are also really useful getting students to create yeah. things is, is is wonderful as well i've been keeping an eye on the question box and there hasn't been anything come in but we're going to uh, leave it open we're, we're nearly hitting five o'clock so um we're, we're reaching the end of the um today's session we have got another poll that we're going to launch just to see um how you feel now after attending the session has your um has your confidence level in relation to, to, to teaching to, to learning theories and teaching them assessing them etc uh, changed at all well i've launched the poll there if you could let us know please how do you feel now um about teaching learning theories in relation to the education childcare and everything we've already talked about how, were you already confident has it consolidated um your knowledge skills and confidence levels is it unchanged is it slightly improved is it moderately improved or has it extremely improved we've got votes coming in thank you so much we're 50 percent so far uh, of attendees have voted already so thanks to those already have um this is just a, a bit of a sense check for us to see um, ex, you know, see if, if it's helped at all. We, we really do like your input and feedback on, on what we do. It really does inform how we do things and what we do. Uh, and I'm just going to put a little um, 
play in as, as you leave today. We're not quite there, but if you leave to, as you leave today, there's a short evaluation form for you to fill in. So please let us know. 100% voted, so I'm going to close that. So lovely, thank you. Everybody have, um, th there's lots of improvements. So that that's great. That's what, that's exactly what we want to hear. But as I say, please let us know in the, um, in the evaluation form uh, what your thoughts are. Uh, Stacey, I'm going to come back to you for this, I think. You certainly are. So um, we have some sessions coming up for you uh, very soon when we plan some dates in for them on attachment theory, um, language acquisition, models of reflection and social identity theory. And those have all, all come out of the T-level where we think there might be tricky areas to teach or something that um, you haven't delivered for a while or something that you need to just refresh upon. Um, and it's also really an opportunity for me to say that if there's anything else that you would like us to um, go through or any CPD for yourselves or for the students, then to, to please let us know. Absolutely. And I will just quickly add the, the PDF of the PowerPoint we've used today is in the handout section of, of the um, control panel. So please um, download it, save it um, for, for reference as well. Um, all we've got left to do is say thank you so much for attending and participating. Um, we do want your input on what we do and how we do it. So please keep that coming for us. Uh, thank you. Farewell and stay safe um, and stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.